Well, uh, President Obama, uh, in his trip to India, I think stated this very clearly, um, that we can have a good relationship uh, with both Pakistan and with India. You don't need to pick one or the other. The President also said that the relationship with India was an indispensable partnership, one of the most important for the 21st century. Uh, what does he mean by that? Um, he talked about the importance of security interests and geopolitical interests, that increasingly the United States and India have uh, common interests in uh, terrorist groups, uh, groups like Al-Qaeda, even Lashkar-e-Taiba. Uh, they have common interests in a counterterrorism policy. Uh, one of the things that uh, I did uh, in the, the first year uh, as ambassador was to sign an historic and unprecedented memorandum of understanding uh, with the United States and the government of India on 16 new intelligence and counterterrorism initiatives uh, of cooperation between our two countries. Uh, what else can we do? Are there maritime security issues that the United States and India can work on uh, to better protect India, but also better protect America? Uh, we, we, we know that uh, uh, when the United States gets better at working with other countries overseas in their ports and their airports and their security mechanisms and their border protection, that can help prevent terrorist attacks onto our homeland. So this is a wise investment by taxpayers and a good investment in our relationship with other countries like India. Well, this is one of the most intriguing and fascinating parts of the relationship between the United States and India. Um, India, by some standards, will have a middle class of somewhere between 300 million people and 600 million people. There will be an unprecedented and historic transformation from people in poverty today into a hopefully vibrant middle class in India. How can the United States help that migration, understand that migration, and benefit from that migration? For instance, you know, cell phones uh, in India are sold for $15, not $300. Uh, monthly plans can be sold for nickels, not tens of dollars. Um, applications that may turn on an irrigation system in a field or deposit rupees in a bank account in a village uh, can be sold uh, to uh, uh, Indians. Uh, small refrigerators for the middle class to help uh, uh, their food stay cold and safe. Uh, who will be manufacturing some of these products? Will it be China? Will it be uh, Europe? Will it be American? Will it be made in the USA and exported to India? Uh, how can the United States understand better this reservation point of economic profitability and commerce. And why is this in India's interest? It's in India's interest because, uh, you know, a stable, vibrant, healthy middle class. Uh, India is really a beacon of hope to so much of Asia as it grows and can show that democracy um, not only is a great place for uh, more and more people, uh, to benefit and grow their families and educate their families and support their families, but is a great example for other countries in the region to emulate. Uh, the Bangladeshs and the Bhutans and the Nepals and the Sri Lankas and, and the Afghanistans. Uh, India can really provide a great example on the economy and democracy. Well, we've really done well, and the Obama administration deserves a lot of credit for bringing Obama, uh, Osama bin Laden to justice. Um, you know, bringing uh, uh, Al Qaeda leadership uh, to justice and going after them. If you attack the United States and you threaten our people, our our civilians, our military people, you're going to pay a price for that. And both the Bush administration and the Obama administration. Um, I think have taken uh, the fight and brought justice to uh, scores of Al-Qaeda leaders that have targeted the United States and United States citizens. Uh, 
the United States has done a better job at sharing information. We said there was a failure of sharing and imagination uh, prior to 9-11. Uh, we have set up a national counterterrorism center that um, has people from different agencies seated right next to each other so that they are literally sharing uh, the, the, the vital intelligence, sensitive intelligence. Another accomplishment has been breaking down the culture of proving that there's a need to know versus uh, creating a new culture of a need to share. And we've created better cultures of sharing um, information and breaking down the domestic and the foreign policy divide on that information. Uh, those have all been successes. Where have there been failures? Where does Congress and, and uh, where do uh, uh, leaders need to do more? Uh, one is Congress needs to reform itself. They've pointed their finger at executive agencies and demanded reform from the CIA and uh, the executive branch. They need to reform their own oversight, particularly on homeland security and intelligence issues. Bring themselves into the 21st century and away from dysfunction. And right now, their oversight on homeland security is dysfunctional, it doesn't work. Um, there is also the need for a unity of command today. Uh, we saw in the uh, response to the Pentagon attack that uh, local efforts, emergency um, uh, efforts, uh, police, fire department, Pentagon officials had practiced a response to an attack. They knew each other by name. They knew what to do. They practiced and practiced and practiced this. This unity of command and one person in charge really leads to potentially good positive outcomes. So many um, forces, so many localities still are not doing this today. And finally, we need to see leadership on uh, communications and interoperability. Uh, we, we saw as one tower collapsed, the uh, emergency personnel in the other tower didn't know about it. Nobody could communicate through the current spectrum. That's still sadly and tragically the case today. We need a new D-block spectrum to be either allocated by public resource or private resource, but we need this to happen tomorrow, not 10 years from now. First of all, I came from a great constituency, my home constituency, my hometown. They demanded that America come before party, that we're not sending you there to Washington, D.C., for your one vote to represent our million voters so that you can further your career or that you can look good in the headlines or that you can stand up for partisan principle. We want you to do things to help us get jobs, to make America better, to improve the outcome for our children, to make the dream more attainable for more middle class people. Uh, so my constituency uh, was demanding of this and I was responsive to that. I also think you have to be willing in leadership to take risks, to say, I'm willing to lose an election over certain things. And again, my Democratic Party, I fight passionately for the principles in my party. I take a backseat to nobody when it comes to me saying I'm a proud Democrat. Uh, uh, I'm a Democrat, I always will be a Democrat because I believe in our traditions and our values. But that doesn't mean that Republicans can't be right on issues and that I can't work with them on balancing the budget like we did in the late 90s and creating surpluses for years and years to come until that was squandered uh, in, in uh, the 2000 time period, uh, that we worked on welfare reform and it worked well uh, and it gave people another rung in the ladder and opportunities to work and be rewarded for work and also a safety net to, uh, net to take care of their children. Uh, that we worked on education flexibility and charter schools and choices for parents that were sending their kids to failing schools. Uh, we didn't perfect that, but we moved the country in a better position. That took Republicans and Democrats working together to do those things. And I think you need to put your country first and America first these days. I think too often times we're, we're stuck on party, we're stuck on partisanship, and we see people that want to destroy the other party, even as a priority over winning a particular outcome. Uh, several skills, um, but the good, the good thing is you can have all the skills in the world, 
and if the opportunity is not there, timing's not there. As I'm always told by my father, uh, timing is everything in life. You can be good, you can be prepared, uh, but if the timing is not there, uh, the right situations don't fall into place, you know, you're not going to have the opportunity to, to do good things and, and do the right thing, hopefully. Uh, so I think, um, you know, to be instructive on leadership skills, uh, you know, being open to new ideas and change. This generation of new people coming in to run for office, to run uh, businesses, to create new jobs in America, to represent us in the diplomatic community. Don't always think about what uh, other people, other ambassadors have done, uh, other secretaries of state have done. Get new ideas. Think outside the box. Bring new paradigms. There's a great new movie out called Moneyball. And it's not about baseball, uh, really. It's about how do you break down the old scheme of thinking like Thomas Kuhn did in the structure of scientific revolutions and create new paradigms for change to take place in this rapidly changing world. So that's one. Another is we can all be very book smart. Um, going to great universities like Harvard and uh, University of Notre Dame and University of California and Indiana University, so many great schools. You also have to be common sense smart and be able to bridge the academic world and the books with the heart and the gut and the common sense to get things done. How do you bring people together with people skills and diplomatic skills? Because at the end of the day, you can be brilliant with your analysis, but if you can't sell it to people, and bring people along to your views and, and make them feel like it's their view and their idea, you're not going to be successful. Trust your heart. Um, you know, develop your common sense and your people skills at the same time that you're developing your, your academic and your strategic skills. And I, I, I think lastly, um, work hard. Know that things are not going to always come easy. Uh, be tenacious. Uh, everything worthwhile comes from sweat and from uh, hard work and through uh, unbelievable tenacity uh, to get things done. Uh, and be thankful to those people that have helped you get there. You know, the unconditional love that I've received from my parents and my wife and my, my family, uh, I couldn't do anything without that kind of support network. Well, two. Um, one is my parents. Uh, all my life, they have been there uh, giving me unconditional love and support and telling me when I was in the fifth grade and I wanted to volunteer for Robert Kennedy's presidential campaign, this is a noble thing to get involved in. This is a good thing if you're putting the people's interests first. So their support has been absolutely uh, um, instrumental and uh, inspirational to me. And secondly, Bobby Kennedy. Uh, uh, I remember as a kid growing up um, in Indiana, and he gave a speech at Indiana University to medical school students, and he talked about America's obligation to help others. And one of the medical students stood up in the crowd and said, Senator, who do you expect to pay for these things? And Robert Kennedy looked right at that person and said, you. He didn't put his finger to the wind and try to read a poll. He didn't uh, uh, evade the question. He said, it is your obligation. You are blessed with a great education. You're going to be a doctor someday. You have an obligation to help others, and I'm going to hold you accountable. You know, that's the kind of leadership we need in the world today, is that Kennedy spirit of new ideas and new creative thinking like Bobby Kennedy had. Uh, thinking outside the box, conservative on some issues, liberal on others, brand new idea uh, on, on a third issue, and the ability to inspire people and bring different groups of people together. Blue collar, white collar, blacks, whites, Asians, every community. He built coalitions. He was a coalition building uh, person and, and I think uh, continues to inspire me to this day. That's why it's great for me to be at the Kennedy School and uh, be at a place named after the Kennedys and President Kennedy that I think has brought you know, justice and an opportunity and uh, a living way of, of uh, memorializing um, and inspiring people to public service.